Okay, if I can ask everybody to take their seats, we'll get going here pretty soon. Well, good afternoon. Hope everybody is enjoying their stay in Orange County. I'm Eric Freed. I'm the Deputy Airport Director for Public Affairs for John Wayne Airport. Um, my pleasure this afternoon to moderate this panel. So we uh, are uh, sponsored this afternoon by San Luis Obispo County Airport and JetBlue. So a big round of applause for them. <laughs> so our panel is going to talk about guest-centered airports, something we all strive for. And whether you're a GA airport or a large hub airport, uh, we're all trying to achieve something that's just above and beyond uh, what you'd see just anywhere else. Um, today, our panel of experts, we're going to share with you their culture for success in st establishing a, a guest-centered airport. And we've got a diverse group of airports with us today, Truckee Tahoe, Missoula, Portland, and Los Angeles. So they're going to share with us their proven strategies and programs and uh, how they provided uh, excellent guest uh, experiences at their airport. So we'll do the presentations and uh, one, two, three, four, and then we'll save uh, a few minutes at the end for some questions and answers. So please uh, be sure to jot down your questions as we're going through the presentations and then we'll follow up at the end. So. Um, as was mentioned earlier, all of the speakers' bios are on the app. If you, hopefully you've downloaded that, so um, you can get um, their background, and so we won't spend much time going over that. Um, so without further ado, our first speaker is Hardy Bullock, and Hardy is the uh, Director of Aviation and Community Services for uh, Truckee Tahoe Airport. So please welcome Hardy. Thanks for having me, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here and see everybody again, and old friends and new faces alike. Uh, this presentation is in stark contrast to the last presentation. There's no math required. There's no runway measurement or distances of any kind. It's a visual presentation, so sit back, relax, drink a cup of coffee, have your dessert. Um, it doesn't take a lot of technical knowledge. Um, so this is the Truckee Tahoe Airport in front of you here. I don't know how many people have been there. It's a, it's a stunning uh, visual setting. Uh, we're on the north shore of Lake Tahoe. What you see in the foreground is the airport with two crossing runways. One of them is about 7,500. The other one's about 4,500. And then you can see the community around the airport uh, all to the west, <coughs> the south, and the, uh, the north. There's a slight corridor in the lower left-hand side of the the screen there, kind of a, an open space, green space. And then there's some hilly terrain to the east, and, and uh, we'll make, make note of that because we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's not a lot of ways to get into or out of the airport without flying over some homes and part of the community. So when Eric asked me to talk about guest-centered airport, I thought, who is our guest? <clears throat> and I know that when I go to a commercial service airport, which we're not, we're general, general aviation airport, we have a lot of charter services and fractional jets that come and go. But I thought of the um, traditional sense in the commercial setting of what it means to be a guest at an airport. So I kind of had to unwind that a little bit in my own mind and think through how we, um, we grasp the concept of guest. So we have two different groups that we primarily serve. We have the aeronautical community, which is obviously the primary component of an airport, the safe launch and recovery of aircraft. We also have the non-aeronautical community or the greater community at large. And at our airport, these are our two guest groups, they're our primary uh, guest groups. And you'll naturally look in at the slide, the left-hand slide is our uh, ramp during the peak period. We get a lot of jets and a lot of general aviation traffic of all kinds. On the right-hand side is a uh, event we did called Run the Runway. It was very, very fun, we had the community out we closed a portion of our smaller runway and we let people um, have a, a running event, uh, a 5K run on there. So two very different types of uh, guests at our airport. So like I was saying, <clears throat> when we are asked who, who is the airport guest, I had to kind of think through that a little bit. And um, our airport is predicated on the fact that 
um, our, our airport should mirror the community in which it serves and the constituency as a, as a whole. So you have these two disparate groups. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the aeronautical group that we serve. 90% um, of our community has never uh, flown into or out of our airport. So that the 10% that's coming and going in the planes we have in the previous slide, we have a huge group that's never been to our airport. They don't experience it. They may, uh, if they've never been involved in anything at the airport, feel that they don't get any benefit from the airport. We have about 33,000 annual operations. I think I was talking to Kevin Buman earlier. I think this summer it's going to be closer to 40,000. We've had a, a basically year over year for the last three years, we've had about a 20 to 24 percent increase in operations. And we kind of bottomed out in 2011, like many other airports, and it's steadily climbing, climbing back now. Um, just estimates we have probably 5,000 pilots that come and go through our facility, of about 100,000 passengers. We have on the Charter uh, side, we have about 10, we did a survey this year, we have right about 10,000 employments on the charter side. So in general aviation terms, these are our guests, these are the people that we serve. If you come to our airport, airport you'll see all the, the typical um, aviation aeronautical um, type of amenities. We have a, a pilot briefing room. We just built a new facility, if you haven't been to our airport recently, it's a, it's a nice building. I guess it's about four and a half years old now, but it's, it's very nice. We have a, um, uh, pilot briefing room, we have a flight training room, we have a little room with a simulator in it, we have a pilot's um, lounge and a kitchen area. So from that perspective, in general aviation terms, those are kind of our guest services for the pilots. Um, we put up some kiosks around our airport to let visiting pilots know that if you're uncomfortable flying into or out of our airport, that you can ask a pilot. And I think about half of the members on my team are, are active pilots, so you can come find somebody at the airport you can talk to them about how it is to come and go from the airport safely. It's a high density altitude environment. It's a very busy uh, terrain constrained environment. So we make those services available. So that's a little bit about uh, on the, on the aeronaut aeronautical side, what we have at our airport. But you still have this other 90% um, that get impact, but no direct benefit. And so we've done some surveys over time using a firm called um, Brian Godby. He's a consultant that does a lot of survey work and we've done it every uh, five years or so for the past 15 years and we've figured out that um, the community one of their biggest um, difficulties with the airport is kind of what what's in it for me if I don't fly and the airport's not offering me something what do I get out of this relationship we're a California special district so we're a ta uh, ta taxing authority and we get about six million dollars annually in tax revenue and another uh, four or so comes from er enterprise funding. So the people can see on their tax bill that the airport's getting funding um, through taxation. And a lot of them say, you know, I don't fly a jet in and out, you know, what, what's there for me? Um, so when we talk about um, who our guest is, that, that constituent group, is our, it's our guest. And so if you're not offering aeronautical benefit to, those, to that group, what else are you going to do? I'm going to show you a little bit about what we've done to try and create that um, guest culture at our airport for those people that don't have any aeronautical benefit. So on the left-hand side is a simulator trailer uh, that we built up. It's a, it's a typical box trailer. And on the far left-hand side, you can see a couple of simulators. They're Redbird simulators that we put in here, and we have a generator inside. We take this trailer down every Thursday nights in the summer to an event called Truckee Thursdays. They close the main street, and we put the uh, simulator trailer right there in the main street. And we have um, dozens of kids every night, and they'll line up, and they'll fly the simulator. And while we're um, helping them fly the simulator, the staff members and some of the team members at the airport are talking to their parents about what happens at the airport, um, what we're doing to try and mitigate noise and annoyance, what we're doing to try and preserve some open space in the community, um, and prevent additional houses from being built underneath the airport and some of the flight paths. We're talking a little bit about um, the politics of running an airport and how it is to be um, governed by federal regulation and state regulation. So we have those conversations on one side of the table while the kids are in the simulator. And we've created some really cool relationships through that. Over time, we've watched these kids grow up. They know the airport, they know our names. Um, they know who to talk to if they ever want something from the airport. Community sponsorship, if you ever want to sponsor a baseball team, they know who to call, um, somebody that they've met during this activity. On the right-hand side, this was interesting. 
um, North Face plays a big uh, role in our community. They have a, um, some of their executives live and work in Truckee and they do team building exercises in Truckee and they called up and they said, we need a big venue to put on a, a, um, a display for our new product line. And I said, well, unfortunately it's December and it's freezing cold and we have no heated hangers. And they said, well, that's great because we're a jacket manufacturer. So we're gonna <laughs> come out there and we're gonna have a party in your hangar. So I charged them for three days of use of this hangar at non-aeronautical rates, which made us a pretty decent profit. And they got to have a great party inside this hangar. It's, it's essentially just, just a big executive box hangar. And so they had a party and we met all these people and talked to them and they since have created kind of a relationship with the airport. The slide on the left is surf air, and I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with the impact surf air's had on airports. Um, I know it's had a tremendous impact on our airport. I just did an audit a while back. I think we've got about 3,000 operations a year from surf air right now. Um, so we have um, sh struggled to make sure that the relationship between surf air, the airport, and the community is going in the right direction. Um, and one of the things that we've done is we've taken kids, every opportunity we have, we try and integrate the community with surf air to let them understand that our constituents and our community, um, the reason surf air is busy at our airport is because our community wants that connection to the Bay Area. And so letting our community understand um, the, the s kind of symbiotic relationship between that um, takes a lot of the mystery out of why the planes are flying over the homes. So these are kids that were there for a uh, STEM education camp that we connected with Surf Air and they got to go talk to the pilots. And a Pilata PC-12 is a pretty cool plane because you can see it and touch it and get inside it and stuff. On the right hand side, this doesn't, the, the photo doesn't do it justice, but we have spent the last year and a half or so getting ready to launch a, a new uh, temporary tower. So we have the tower that opened Jan, uh, June 15th. When the tower opened up, um, we were so engrossed in trying to make sure that the um, T's were crossed and the I's were dotted and that everything from a safety and aeronautical perspective was done correctly. We um, had a community outreach plan, but, but what we didn't have is we didn't have anybody that could see or, or visit or view the tower. So we had a open house um, and Cirrus brought out some of their tests, uh, some of their new, newly developed aircraft and some of the flight design testing um, up to the airport. And we had this tower open house. We had a food truck out there and we thought, you know, it's kind of a cool and windy day. Who's going to show up? We had, um, I, I think we probably had 500 people from the community show up to look at our temporary tower. Um, as pilots and airport users, I know we're interested in seeing towers and seeing what happens. I don't think of the public as being a, a group of people that want to go visit a control tower, but it was really cool to see what happened because we had staff members and, f air and pilot community and the greater community come out to this event. And we spent, I think, about $1,500 on tacos from this red truck, but we got all this great um, connection to the community that came out and saw our tower. But we also got to tell them that a big part of the tower is trying to uh, reduce community annoyance. So we got to talk through the process of what was going on there. Um, the fire truck on the left was purchased with um, um, tax revenue um, from our uh, airport. And this fire truck is a partnership between, uh, we don't have our services directly at the airport, but it's a partnership between the local fire district and the airport. And so what we get from it is we get a fully equipped and trained our frig. But what the community gets is when it's not responding to something at the airport, which is quite seldom, um, it's responding to vehicle accidents or brush fire. So it's, an, it's an, an, an initial attack vehicle. It's got foam and spray nozzles and a video camera where it can, um, spray things out of the truck where the firefighters don't have to get out. But we've, um, we've, this vehicle has been deployed um, about 90 times in the last uh, 18 months on different calls. So it's kind of a, a mutually beneficial uh, arrangement between the two organizations. On the right hand side is a quarterly pilot uh, outreach meeting. Making connections with the pilot um, community is one of the most important pieces um, to success uh, in creating that guest-centered approach, I think, because if you don't have the support from the pilot community, as much outreach that you do on the community side, you, you're gonna have to balance this. Um, we're not getting what's due to us on the pilot side. And so having that connection with the pilot community, I think is, is one of the most important components of making it successful. Um, the left-hand side, I'm gonna note that if anyone, can anyone see the Hertz sign back there? 
there, there's a building back there behind that flagpole. That hangar collapsed in, I think, February. Um, it got so much snow on it, the whole building, the door lifted up and the whole thing collapsed. So it's no longer, if you come to our airport, you won't see that. Uh, it's gone now. Uh, thank goodness, by the way. Um, <laughs> the park is behind the bicycles. And the park, um, on a summer day, or even a shoulder season day, which is important in Truckee because we have, I think, a month and a half of summer and the rest is winter or slightly winter. So the park, when it's sunny in those shoulder seasons, um, people will bring their family out and sit there because it's unobstructed sun. There's no trees, there's no shade, it's just sun. Um, so they can come out and do that, and that's making guests of all the community. Many of these people, I, um, almost all of them, I, I don't recognize. Um, so they're coming from the community, they're going to the airport, they're eating at the deli, they're riding these bikes, they're talking to airport staffers, their kids are watching planes, they're learning about STEM education, so they're, 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 they're our guests when they're there, and um, they're making that connection to the airport. On the right-hand side is something, um, it's paint recycling. And so I don't know uh, in other communities, but in our community, it's hard to get rid of stuff because it's really expensive to dispose of it. So we, we paid a paint recycling company to come in and host a free paint recycling in conjunction with the town of Truckee. Um, so they come in, they set up, um, it's quite intensive use of the ramp space, but it's really worth it. We didn't know how much turnout we were gonna get. Um, we ended up having like lines of cars for two days straight, turning stuff in. So it's not, um, making the community at large and the aeronautical community your guest at our airport, um, it, it's not just all sunshine. It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of commitment um, because sometimes it's difficult to define a mission uh, in our organization that isn't just about aviation. And I know that if you go to work at an airport, it feels like you're going to work to launch and recover aircraft safely, to understand about aeronautical terminology, to understand about the technical portions of your job. And then you throw this other piece, this community piece in, it can be really tough. Um, it takes political capital and political will. You need to have leaders that are committed to reaching out into the community and being uh, involved in the community at a level beyond just what the airport has to offer or just what the airport needs. You have to have some political willpower. You need a group of elected officials, in my opinion, that are committed to the mission. If you don't, it gets very confusing for staff to understand what you're doing there on a daily basis because we wake up as airport executives um, with safety in mind. I mean, I know what gets me out of bed in the morning is wondering how uh, everybody's gonna be that day when they're coming and going from the airport. So you need the you need your elected officials uh, in the same lane every day. You need to spend money if you have money in the right way. And I can't over uh, underemphasize this. If you, um, we're, we're very well funded, that's no mystery. And it makes our job much easier. But the first uh, organization or person within an organization to come under scrutiny will be somebody that spends money in a way that wasn't applied uh, wisely, honestly, transparently. And so we have come under scrutiny um, for that, and, and we pay a lot of attention to how we spend money, but if you spend it in the right way, it can create a tremendous amount of benefit within the community. And like we talked about earlier, you need some significant support from the pilot community because um, at certain um, cycles within our uh, organization's history, the pilot community has felt like, you know, you guys are out buying this 1,400-acre ranch next to the airport to rent the houses, and I can't even get my plane in the front door because there's cracks two and a half feet wide in the asphalt. Those are really significant discussions. And if you ignore them long enough, the politics will change. The airport board will change, the elected leadership will change, and people will get what they want. So you have to pay attention and you have to cultivate those relationships because without that, the pilots have a tremendous amount of voice and they also have federal regulation backing them as you know, the 1316 type of situation can occur if you don't pay close attention to that. So what we had to do, in my opinion, uh, and this is just you know my opinion from working at that airport, but what we had to do to make the airport available to all the guests is we had to define ourselves continuously. So we oftentimes have conversations that seem circular, but um, they're really conversations kind of recommitting our group and our organization to what our, what our mission is to that guest, which is we do have two totally disparate guest um, groups. We have a disparate constituency just within our community. We have a, a, a resort destination community. We also have, um, a, we have you know, this very wealthy um, group 
that comes and visits us, and then we have kind of a, a working class group that wants to live there and make a home and educate their kids there. So there's, there's difficulty in that. We have to constantly um, d define ourselves continuously through the conversations that we have. We had to align our internal mission. This is something that's very important to me. Um, in our uh, airport is, we have our operations and maintenance staff, and then we have an aviation community um, outreach staff, and then we have our elected board of directors and a community advisory team. Making sure that all those groups are working toward the same mission can be difficult some days, because when I look out at the ramp and people are hustling and they're fueling and they're running GPUs, I was talking earlier, we had about, we, we're having days right now about 400 operations a day. Well, I'm in my office typing a staff report and the guy outside looks at me like, what, you know, what have you done today? What are you doing today? And I'm looking at him going, I wish I could get out there and I didn't have to type this report. And so aligning that mission and getting everybody to understand that their job is important and their job is valuable is really challenging. It's challenging and it's critical to making it work right because I've heard time and time again, like we're here to serve, we're here to fuel airplanes. We're not here to set up cones for some community event. We're not here to clean the hangar out so that you can have some special event. Well, yeah, we are. Because if you don't, what happens is the, the airport doesn't function the way it should and we're not meeting the mission for all of our guests. And I'll just, ref I'll just go back to the original, which is we have to keep reflecting our community at every turn. Our community has grown and changed recently, and so we have to keep, keep looking at what our community needs from us. And um, that takes some, um, some insight, and it takes um, some relationships, welcoming people and um, being, being a listener as much as you're trying to get that information out, listening to your community. Um, that's it for me. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Hardy. Our next speaker is Chris Jensen, who is the director at uh, Missoula International Airport. So please welcome Chris. Thank you, Eric. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's nice to come here to Southern California, where it's actually cooler than it is in Montana right now, and, and maybe uh, even a little less smoggy. We have a lot of forest fires right now, and so it's nice to be here, and I appreciate it. And unfortunately, I have to leave as soon as I'm done. So, uh, But I was a member of this chapter long, long, long ago, I think like Scott Brockman said, uh, when I was at the Reno Airport and uh, at the Elko Airport. So it's good to see all of you and, and uh, see some old friends. So Hardy did a great job of talking about general aviation and, and uh, how they uh, reflect the guest-centered experience for their user group. Uh, I'm going to move you now into a small commercial service airport, and I do need to correct Eric here for just a moment. We're not the Missoula International Airport. We're the Missoula Wannabe International Airport. <laughs> so, all right. So just a little bit about uh, our airport, um, since maybe some of you aren't familiar with it. Uh, we're a non-hub airport. We have about 400,000 annual employments. Uh, we have five airlines, Alaska, Allegiant, Delta, Frontier, United, 12 nonstop destinations, 31 full-time employees, 25 part-time employees. Uh, we sit about halfway between Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks. And in fact, not only are we the Missoula Wannabe International Airport, but we're also talking about changing our name like so many airports are doing. We have the Bozeman Yellowstone Airport or the Glacier Park International Airport. I think we're going to become the, uh, the Yellow Glacier International <laughs> Airport. So we think the t-shirt sales will be great. Sorry. I'm trying to keep you awake. It's that time of the day, right? Um, so the guest-centered experience, like Hardy, I had to step back and say, well, what exactly is that? We have a lot of different guests that we deal with. And, and Hardy talked a lot about the private side, the general aviation side. Uh, we also have, of course, at, at our airport, the commercial passengers. We have the lead, and, and amongst those commercial passengers, we have leisure and business travelers. We have adults and children. Uh, and we have the meters and greeters within the terminal that, that are there to pick up grandma or, or you know, meet somebody as they're getting off an airplane. And so all of those people um, you know, are, are, are guests, and, and we take care of them on a, on a daily basis. And so um, you know, I think that's a pretty diverse group, we can all agree. Um, so this is where I feel like I need to put on my, my Captain Obvious uniform here. We all know this, right? I mean, the minimums that we need to provide uh, it was discussed at length and much more eloquently than I can uh, by the gentleman from Disneyland today. 
uh, you know, clean, efficient, friendly, professional, safe. Those are the bare minimums. We all know this, right? And we do this all day long. Um, so the other challenges that we have to dis discuss is when do we start to provide those, those elements? And when does that end? And what we know in today's world is that it's much earlier than it ever used to be. Uh, we now have months in advance, in some cases, people getting on our websites. Uh, they're calling the airport for information. And so we need to be prepared for that. We need to make sure that we can help those, uh, those people well before their trip, and in some cases, long after they've traveled. Uh, we've tried to boil it down in Missoula to a very simple rule. It's what we learned in kindergarten, right? The golden rule, treat people like you want to be treated. Uh, it's very easy to remember, and we repeat that time and time again uh, because it, it's easy for us to, people like me at least, to, to repeat. I can remember it. Um, and so, you know, that's about how simple it is for us. Um, so the other challenge that we have is really understanding what people want. And, of course, I'm the first flunky of the Katie Jones School of Social Media. She did come to our airport and and try to teach me, and, and fortunately others on our staff, and, and they figured it out. I, as of yet, have not. Uh, but of course we use social media, and if there are, there are those of you out there who aren't using social media, uh, there, people are talking about your airport, whether you think they are or not. They're talking about their experience, and so we try to immediately respond when we see something on social media. We have uh, a group of people that know how to tweet and know how to look at Yelp and all those things that I have yet to figure out, but Katie's going to help me someday. We also have the good fortune of having the University of Montana in our airport or in our community. Um, we actually use their marketing classes, so it's a part of their program, and their, their students come out to the airport. They survey our travelers. In fact, as I was traveling out yesterday, one tried to survey me. I complained a lot about the airport administrator, but uh, <laughs> other than that, I told him I was a little bit biased. Uh, we use chamber surveys, which are great for business travelers. Uh, we have a state uh, institute for tourism and recreation, recreation research uh, that does surveys at our airport as well. But probably the most important, most useful survey is our Wi-Fi survey. And so uh, when you come to the airport, if you want to use Wi-Fi at, airport, at our airport, we don't charge you for it. But what we, what we do ask is for information. So in order to get onto our Wi-Fi, you have to fill out a 26-question survey. So it's a pretty in-depth uh, survey and the good news about all of that is that you get your business travelers, you get your leisure travelers, you get everybody, right? Nowadays we're all getting onto Wi-Fi, we're all using uh, the internet, whether we're downloading movies or checking email or whatever the case may be. And so we have found that this has become a very valuable tool and we get almost immediate uh, reaction from people traveling. It's not a delayed response from a uni university survey or a chamber survey. I know the day that somebody traveled if they had a good experience or they had a bad experience by looking at that Wi-Fi wi survey. So very useful uh, tool for us. Uh, so engaging our industry partners. So one of the things that we found is this is a never ending, um, I'll say battle. Uh, we certainly have a, a, a meeting we indoctrinate, if you will, employees when they come to the airport uh, in, in the customer service mentality that we have. But you can't stop there, right? I mean, we all get busy, we forget, whatever. We get involved with what our, what, whatever our jobs are. So we have a monthly tenant meeting um, where we uh, sit down with all of, our, uh, all of our tenants, and this is everybody, our airlines, our rental cars, our concessionaires, and we talk about uh, a lot of different things, but one of the big topics is customer service. And the idea is to continually remind them, to continually push that idea of the golden rule. And so we really spend a lot of time every month focused on that effort. And then, of course, we have the TSA. They just slid up there from the bottom. Um, they attend these tenant meetings as well, but we also go to their town hall meetings. So the, the, the TSA has uh, a, a monthly town hall meeting, they call them, with all of their staff. And so we will have myself or somebody from my staff attend those meetings. And that gives us the opportunity to reach out to all of those TSA employees and explain to them that you know, you're know you either the last experience that somebody has at Missoula or close to the last experience. We all are being paid by these travelers. So you know, be professional, but be friendly. Do your job, but uh, there's nothing wrong with smiling or engaging them in conversation. And so uh, that's been a very positive thing, and we've definitely seen 
uh, I think, some improvement in, in, our, in our TSA folks. We also ex ex hope to exemplify the behavior that we expect. Uh, so we do a lot of what I call managing by walking about. And so what that means is I get up out of the office and I go wander the terminal. And, and I, if I see somebody that needs help, I, get, I go assist them. I'll carry their bags. I'll push the wheelchair, whatever the case may be. And we encourage our entire staff to do that exact same thing. So when we take breaks, we go out in the terminal and we wander around. And so oftentimes you'll see uh, airport administrative staff actually wandering the airport looking for somebody to help. And it's just a good opportunity to stretch your legs, but it's also a good opportunity uh, to interact with our, with our traveling public or our meters and greeters or whoever it might be. We also hold our, account, our partners are account, accountable. So I had, as an example, the Delta station manager in my office about two weeks ago uh, because we had a situation, a customer service situation, as it happens, that was less than acceptable. And so we had a very uh, frank conversation. And at the end of it, uh, he agreed and, and uh, you know, went out of his way to rectify the situation. And so you know, we will, uh, when we see situations that aren't acceptable, we will call them out. We will point them out. Uh, but more important to us, is that we like to recognize superior performance. So one of the things we do is we have these catch somebody doing something good cards. So I carry these in my wallet. All of the airport staff carries these in their wallet. If I see somebody that gives su superior um, customer service, I can put my name on it and their name on it and give it to them. And it's good for lunch at the restaurant. So the, all, all of our staff has these. And uh, every time they see somebody do something good, uh, they catch them doing something good. They give them one of these cards. And so that's become a very popular program. We also use the same catch line that, uh, that Disney used, that TSA used, which is see something, say something. But we use it in a different way. So our way of using it is if we see you do something good, you know, we, we immediately go up and tell you, hey, that was great customer service. You did an excellent job. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we still let TSA use our tagline, but... Uh, but we think that it's much better when it's a positive tagline. Um, one of the other things that makes us a little bit unique is that uh, we're in the aviation support services. So what that means for us is we handle airlines. Um, not many airports in the country do. Are there any in here that do? Any airports here that actually uh, are in the ground handling business? Yeah, it's uh, oh, Hardy, Hardy's in the ground handling business, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little bit rare for airports. Uh, but it does give us a unique insight, I think, into that world. Uh, we provide uh, above wing and below wing, so ticket counter through throwing the bags. Um, you can see our crew here, they're just pushed back. That was the very first Frontier launch when they started three years ago. Uh, we have about 25 part-time employees, and in addition to that, our administrative staff, our airport operations staff, are all trained to work the airline too. So we can surge a flight. We can supplement the ground handlers uh, if need be. And, and so there may be times, I can tell you, we must have had a convention of people that needed wheelchairs. We had a bunch that, uh, that came off. And so the administrative staff went up and assisted by pushing wheelchairs. So uh, we can help uh, with that ground handling as well, which is uh, the idea being that it gets the ground handling staff back into the act of turning that airplane, of getting it in uh, servicing it and getting it back out. One of the nice things about this, of course, is that it's profitable, but the other maybe bigger benefit is that it gives us a, a much deeper level of customer service mentality. We interact more with the passengers. We have a better understanding of what their needs are. It also gives us a better understanding, as I said earlier, of, of our fellow airlines and what they're dealing with. Um, and this is kind of continuing that thought process that it, where it's more than ground handling. Um, it's also that it gives us some ideas that when, when we see the challenges that our, that our other ground handlers are experiencing that we can immediately react to them. So uh, an example of that is where we were dropping our, on our inbound bags, so on our bag claim, uh, we were dropping them and the airlines were having to sit and wait for all of the bags to clear the belt because of our security requirements. Well, we started to realize that this was taking people out of the operation of turning that aircraft. And so what we were able to do is staff that with a summer airport employee. We do it during peak season. Um, and so we have seasonal employees that come in and we put them in that room. They maintain the security. That gets those airline folks the ability to clear that room much quicker, get back out to uh, get involved in, in servicing that airplane and get it on its way. Um, we also now uh, push wheelchairs 
uh, for all of the other airlines. So again, the idea being getting those passenger, or I'm sorry, those uh, airline employees back into the act of turning that airplane. If they're dedicated to a wheelchair passenger, uh, you know, from curb to, to aircraft or aircraft to curb, that means they're not available to, to help service that aircraft or help deal with the other passengers. And so we're able to do that as a staff. We don't have uh, a skycap service, but we do provide that service. And so the last bullet is, of course, we assist our airline partners in any, any way we can. I can tell you I have thrown bags for other airlines. Um, I have, we've parked their airplanes. We've done anything and everything we can uh, to help them. Uh, part of that you need to know, though, is they have to accept your training program. And so we've gone through a process with Delta and with United, not Alaska. Um, and, of course, we handle Allegiant and Frontier so that they will accept our training program so we can do those things for them. And so maybe the last part of that is that I think the fact that we do provide this service creates this spirit of entrepreneurship. And an example of that is our mechanics. We have two of them uh, came in one day after watching this ground handling operation and said, hey, you know, we think we have an opportunity here too. The airlines are flying in, driving in employees to service the ground service equipment. And, you know, they're coming from Salt Lake, they're coming from Minneapolis, they're coming from Seattle. What if we were to provide that service? We do it for a profit. And, uh, you know, we're here, we have facilities, they're out working in the cold in some cases, and so we actually do that now for a couple of our airlines. So, uh, again, that, that kind of foster the, the change of the, in the way we think of things. Um, it's also just kind of ancillary uh, air service development tool. So when we go to airlines, one of the, the incentives now that we can provide is uh, ground handling. It makes it very easy for them to start service in Missoula. They basically show up with the airplane we provide all the ground handling service here, whether it's ticket counter, uh, whether it's, you know, gate or ramp. Um, and so, you know, it makes it easy for them. And in fact, Frontier told us when they started service in Missoula that it was one of the easiest station startups they've ever had. And finally, it encourages innovation. The picture that you see here is just an example of one of our employees. We were, at, were in a situation where we're actually getting ready to build a new terminal. So our gate areas are very tight. and. One of our employees came up with the idea of, why don't we just build a deck? We really just needed this space in the summer during peak season. Uh, it's, we don't, it's quick and easy to build. Uh, we don't have to heat it, we don't have to cool it. And we thought, you know, what a brilliant idea. We did it. It turns out it was one of the most popular things according to that social media thing that we talked about a little bit ago. And so actually in the new terminal that we're designing now and we'll break ground on in uh, about a year from right now, we now have a new, t uh, new deck, much larger, that'll be uh, with fireplaces, so we'll actually be able to use it in the wintertime as well. The final thing that I thought I would just mention is IROPS, and this is where we're truly tested, all of us, anytime we uh, deal with an IROPS situation. It's, it's much easier to give good customer service when everything is going perfect. It's when things aren't going perfect that, that uh, you know, we're, we're truly tested. So the first thing that we do is we actually empower our staff to make the right situation. They have the power to spend money. There have been times when we've bought hotel rooms for airlines, for our, I'm sorry, for airline passengers, when the airline itself would not pay for those rooms, just because it was worth it to maintain the relationship. We have agreements with hotels that are close to the airport, and so uh, our staff is empowered to do the right thing. Now, you know, there's a limit to that, of course, and, and we'll have a conversation with them after the fact if, if they've abused that, but in general, it, it works out very well. Obviously, try to anticipate and be proactive, and, you know, there's so many things that you can, that you can dream up, and, and so Billings, uh, one of our neighboring airports, had a, an El Al flight that ended up having some significant challenges uh, just because it had uh, 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 many of the passengers were Jewish, and so they needed kosher meals. We hadn't thought about that before, but we do try to think about all of these types of scenarios. We're a diversionary airport as well, and so we do get flights a lot of times from. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's that kind of stuff that we'll brainstorm. We work on our IROPS plan once a year. We sit down, we brainstorm, we talk about, we add to it. Um, and then, final thing in the IROPS is we focus on communications, and this is probably. Uh, across all areas, of course, the most important thing or one of the most important things, and that, you know, whether it's to the, com the customers or our policy uh, for the airlines we handle is that we're required to update the customers every 15 minutes. It may be the same message for six hours, but every 15 minutes they're going to hear it so they know that we're there with them 
we're, uh, we're, you know, as conditions change, we'll give them a new message, but we're not gonna abandon them for hours at a time. Also to our stakeholders, I don't know, uh, I used to get frustrated because uh, we'd have an airline cancel or a flight cancel, I should say, and the restaurant would, would have closed because nobody told them, hey, there's a whole bunch of passengers here uh, that are gonna need service, that are gonna need food. And, and so one of the important things for us now is anytime we have a delay, anytime we have a cancellation, that we immediately start going out to notify all of our stakeholders. And then finally, our employees, we make sure they're fully in the loop. So whatever the case might be, if it's a winter op situation and we're looking at a closed runway for a period of time, we're making sure that we're going out uh, to our employees and to the airline employees and, and letting them know this is what we're seeing, this is what we're experiencing, and, and this is what we expect. And so that they, they, uh, they have the information. So with that, I am done and I will pass the baton. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Our next speaker is uh, Senior Manager of Customer Relations for Portland International Airport. Please join me in welcoming Walt Mar Marchbanks. Sorry. <laughs> all right, so first of all, I realize this is the Southwest AAAE, I'm not lost, um, but hopefully I'll get a chance to see some of you up at the Northwest Conference in Eugene, which is just uh, coming a couple weeks, I guess. So um, I thought I'd start off by leading off by what makes PDX so special? So. First of all, uh, Portland has a really unique culture. So can I get a, a show of hands? How many people have heard about our carpet? Has anybody heard about our carpet? OK, if you haven't, your kids probably have, by the way. So our carpet is really, really unique. Uh, but it's, our culture is, is way more than just carpet. Our culture is customer centric, and it really starts at the executive level and works its way down. So uh, everybody on our executive team supports customer service. The fact that I have a job is a clear testament to that. So. Um, I think that customer service is really integral into everything that we do at PDX. Um, talking about our focus on the passenger experience, so we have some things that are pretty unique. Uh, a lot of other airports have them, but um, street price. So first of all, all of our concessions are the same price as they are outside of the airport. We have lots and lots of free Wi-Fi. We have uh, a great uh, customer service program. Uh, we've got lots and lots of things that are really driven on the passenger experience. Um, the other piece is great relationships. So uh, those of you who have TSA airports, um, you know, I've learned that the relationship with TSA is not uniform, and I like to think that we have a very unique relationship with our TSA, a very special relationship, and the TSA are oftentimes, like, um, like Chris mentioned, was kind of the, the first or last uh, group that you're going to interact with as a person that's coming through the airport. So it's really important to engage with the TSA and engage with all your business partners. We've done a pretty good job with that and uh, really work to uh, to bring our business partners close and engage with them on a regular basis, whether it be with our monthly concessions managers meetings, our monthly airline station managers meetings. And I'm also, you know, in my role, I'm the strategic partner liaison with all of our travel partners. So Travel Oregon, Travel Portland, uh, the Consular Corps, and all those folks as well uh, in our market. So um, the other thing is that we listen to our customers. And I think that I really can't overstate the importance of that. Um, at PDX, we have a survey program that we do in-house. So on an annualized basis, we survey between four and 5,000 passengers a year, uh, really through two major types of surveys. Number one is a terminal user survey, which really looks at demographic data. And the other one is our customer satisfaction survey, which really looks at the overall passenger experience and you know, the, the process that those folks go through and where we can improve on all of our processes. So, um, and what we do is we take all of that input and we, we respond to it. So, you know, regularly we hear we want more Wi-Fi, we want more seats, and we want more power. Um, those are really kind of the three things that we hear. And we use that feedback to sort of prioritize our capital projects. So we're just in the process right now of upgrading our Wi-Fi. Um, that's a, a response to some of that feedback. Um, we recently added some comfortable chairs in our concourse connector. I know it seems like a kind of a small thing, but 10 chairs that are comfortable that people can lay out in, it actually makes a big difference. And every time I walk by, you know, I, I can't help but think to myself, yeah, okay, well, you know, we listened, we responded, and, and here we are. We got some happy people, and that, that makes a big difference. So a lot of folks focus on the chain of service, and we kind of think of this as, you know, a, a chain, and every employee at the airport sort of fits in in this chain somewhere. You know, we used to say runway to roadway, but I think that everybody understands now that with technology, the passenger journey really begins before they actually get to the airport. It begins when they, when they look at the app or when they look at the website. Um, and whether that be uh, the airline's website or the airport's website, 
But folks are going to interface with technology first and foremost. And then they'll work through this passenger journey until they get on the plane. And you know, every, every touch point that you have is a touch point with an airport person uh, or you know, some type of technology that's related to the airport. So we try to help people understand that they have a place in that chain and to help them take ownership of that, but also see the big picture and understand that you know, the passenger journey is bigger than them. So something might not have gone right before the customer got to them, but they have a responsibility to, to make that better and actually go forth and, and make that passenger journey a better thing. So I want to talk a little bit about customer relations. Customer relations versus customer service. Customer relations is really the relationship with the customer. Um, and I really like building relationships with people. I've, I've got a chance to meet a lot of you. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stick around tonight. I'd love to go to the beach party. It sounds like a, a lot of fun. But um, I'm actually leaving for New York tomorrow morning um, because I'm re receiving the Travel and Leisure Best Domestic Airport Award with my boss in New York. I know, I'm getting mean mugged. But uh, it's going to be fun there, too. So. Uh, but hopefully, if, if I don't get a chance to meet you, um, we'll get to meet later. But uh, this is my department. So we have a Paging Information Center, our art program, music program, our volunteer program, and Make the Connection program. And all of those together combined help to sort of maximize the passenger experience. And I'll touch base on these quickly. I know we're uh, running a little short on time. So first of all, our Paging Information Center is open from 6 in the morning until 11.30 at night. And it really serves two primary uh, functions. So Number one was responding to phone calls. We get about 10,000 phone calls a month in our call center. Um, and the other piece is managing our FlyPDX Twitter. And we really use Twitter specifically out of all the social media tools as uh, really almost a, a chat feature. So our target time in terms of responding to Twitter feedback is five minutes. So if you send something to at FlyPDX right now, like at FlyPDX, Walt is bombing his presentation or whatever, they'll get a response back in five minutes. And they'll probably agree, yeah, thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so anyways, uh, our FlyPDX Twitter is something that we take a lot of pride in. Uh, we have some really witty folks that are involved in it, and it's the Paging and Information Center staff that do that, speak on the port's behalf. They go through a rigorous training uh, program, uh, and they, they turn out some really cool content. So I encourage you to follow us at FlyPDX if you get a chance. Next is our, our music program. So there's lots of airports that have music programs. I like to think of our uh, music program as being pretty unique. Um, number one, because they're all volunteers, and that's not common. Um, we have about 200 hours of live music each week at our airport. And you know the program was established in the wake of 9-11. We started off with three pianos, and the program has just grown and grown and grown. Now we've got 30 active musicians. Um, those musicians vary. Uh, we've got pianists. We've got uh, a harp player. We've got uh, a marimba. We've got an African kora. We've got lots and lots of acoustic guitar players. And they come out and they play anywhere between two and three hours. Um, and they engage with passengers. They're allowed to sell their music. Uh, they're also allowed to, you know, to book gigs and engage with passengers and some of them. Um, you know, but they're there to promote their, their personal interests. Uh, but they also enhance the ambiance inside the terminal. So you know, unlike other airports, we look at the music program not necessarily as you know, it's not a rock and roll venue. You know, it's there to en enhance the ambiance. You know, reduce anxiety, reduce tension, uh, and help people enjoy their journey. And that's what it's really all about for us. Our art program. So we have uh, a number of elements that are kind of unique with our art program. First of all, we've got six rotating exhibits that change out every six to 12 months. You may have a lot of business travelers or frequent travelers that come through the airport, and the art just kind of tends to blend in after a while. I mean, if it's you know a sculpture or terrazzo flooring, it's very beautiful. But our, our rotating art program is is neat because it gives somebody it gives people something unique and something new every time they pass through the airport. We also have two temporary site-specific art locations where we pay artists an honorarium and they actually create works for a specific space. We have 25 uh, permanent art pieces that. You know, generally are done through uh, a capital you know, planning process. Uh, we do not have a percent for art program at our airport, but we do have a commitment from our executive leadership to integrate art whenever possible into uh, capital projects. So we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we have a lot of really beautiful permanent art. Uh, and lastly, we have the Hollywood Theater. So if you get a chance to come to PDX, and hopefully you all will at some point, our Hollywood Theater is another element of our art program, and we play uh, short movies, they're all done through the Hollywood Theater, which is a local nonprofit. Um, and the, the content gets uh, changed out every quarter. So there's 10 short movies that get played. It gives uh, local short filmmakers a venue to, to showcase their work. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to let passengers have something unique and, and relax for a minute before they get on a flight. So that all sort of, all elements of the art program kind of work together to just create another layer of uh, passenger satisfaction. Next, our Volunteer Information Program, or VIP. 
Uh, we currently have about 140 volunteers, and they're responsible for a number of different things. Um, number one is international flight support. So we have uh, some folks that are actually down in the FIS. They um, kind of bookend the process. So uh, when folks come off an international flight, they actually will greet the international flight and kind of help them get in the right area, whether they're using global entry or getting into the APC queue. And then at the end, after they get their, their luggage, then they also assist at that final wayfinding location where people are either connecting or getting on the bus as PDX is their final destination. So it's, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, this, these people are really truly the last interaction that uh, folks are going to have with the airport. So it's very important to us. Uh, the information booths, um, which we have two of uh, down in baggage claim on the north and south end, those are open from uh, 8 in the morning until midnight. Um, we've really been focusing a lot of energy on evening traffic. Uh, the airport is exceptionally busy, especially between 9 o'clock and midnight. So um, everybody at our operations management level, our chief operating officer included, have been working a swing shift and will continue to work swing shifts one week uh, a month through the end of the summer to really understand uh, the constraints that our passengers go through late at night um, because that does make a big difference in the passenger journey. Um, we also have a volunteer lounge that they have a shift for. Um, we have rovers that actually will rove the terminal and look for people that are doing this. You know, we call them spinners. So they'll look around for spinners. Uh, and then they also assist with uh, special projects. So airline inaugurations, that kind of thing. So, um, and finally, our airport-wide customer service program, which is called Make the Connection. So that was rolled out in February of 2010. Um, it has working committee advisement. So we have 10 recognized industries at the airport, and each of those industries has a representative or representatives on the working committee. So it's currently about 30 people strong. Um, they meet monthly, and they really go to, uh, to advocate and push for you know, customer service change that needs to happen at the airport. Um, we have some core values that we call PD expectations, so be knowledgeable, be friendly, be proactive. Um, all of those go to sort of reiterate the, the, you know, the, the words that we're trying to get out uh, to the public. So um, it's really based on customer service at its, at its core root and its grassroots. Um, and there are really two major elements of the Make the Connection program. The first is training, communication, and information. So we actually will go to you know, our, our business partners' uh, staff meetings and provide customer service training. That's an element of the program. Um, we also have like a standing agenda item on the airline station manager's meeting as well as the concessions manager's meeting where we talk about things that are going on at the airport and try to communicate uh, those changes to keep everybody informed. Um, the recognition and incentive piece is one of the most unique piece. Um, when I was listening to the Disney presentation, we actually also have a hero award. I'm not sure if they stole it from us or we stole it from them, but either way, we've got one. Um, and it's kind of the same thing. So uh, I guess maybe six months ago, we had some EMTs that, uh, you know, that ended up getting a call. They were on their break, uh, and they saved somebody's life by using uh, an AD as well. So um, we have an opportunity every quarter. We take all the stories that we get from, uh, from passengers or from airline station managers or concessionaires. They send them all to us, and then the working committee uh, does a vote, and we select one winner from each of the 10 categories, and then we public, publicly recognize them at a quarterly awards luncheon. Um, and some of the stories are absolutely touching. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the best things about my job. I get goosebumps whenever I'm reading the stories. Um, some of them are, are just mind-blowing. Uh, you wouldn't even believe it. Um, so that's an opportunity. We also do an annual banquet, which is probably the only time a year that we get the entire airport population under one roof. Um, and it really kind of helps people understand, not only does it do, you know, it, it you know, gives you recognition for your employees, your frontline staff, um, but more importantly, you know, it helps everybody understand that this is so much bigger than just them. It's so much bigger, you know, some people, you know, serve food and some people rent rental cars, but we're all in the customer service business. All of us are. Um, so that's just one opportunity to kind of get everything, uh, you know, get everybody together and understand that uh, holistically. The final piece is comment tracking. So all the information, all the feedback that we receive via Twitter, uh, via email, uh, and over the phone, we take all that information and we track it in a comment tracking system, um, which allows us to respond to, you know, to trends and things that are happening at the airport. So that's it in a nutshell, guys. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate the opportunity. And I'll turn it back over to Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Walt. Our final speaker is a Chief Experience Officer at Los Angeles World Airports. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Yamamoto. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here today. So happy to be here. Um, there's a lot of exciting things happening at LAX, and um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share some of them with you. Um, but first, a little bit of background on LAX. Um, 
just this is where I start building some sympathy for my job and where you start feeling sorry for me. Um, but really um, creating a guest-centered airport is so challenging for any airport, but for us at LAX, it's especially challenging because of the sheer size and volume of the things that we're dealing with. Um, so just a little background, LAX is owned and operated by Los Angeles World Airports, and we also own and operate uh, Van Nuys General Aviation. Um, we are a department of the city of Los Angeles. Um, we're very busy. Um, we're the busiest origin and destination airport in the world. Um, we expect to handle 83 million passengers this year. Um, we are the fourth busiest in the world and second busiest in the nation. Um, to add to that complexity, we have nine separate terminals. So depending on where you're flying th through, um, you may have a completely different experience. Um, so it's like nine different airports, but in the end to our guests, it's just one airport experience. Um, adding a layer of complexity on top of that, we have this thing called traffic, vehicular traffic, um, and it's almost legendary. We have about 95,000 vehicles per day that circulate around the airport, around and around and around, and um, at peak times, there's about 6,000 cars going around our airport. Um, it's one of our uh, biggest complaints that we get is the traffic congestion, and some have described LAX as um, nine different airports tied together by a traffic jam. So some of you could probably attest to that. Um, and then just one more thing to add to that stress is we've got a ton of construction going on. This is the other challenge for any airport. It's really this multi-linked service delivery chain that's made up of so many different agencies and companies um, and contractors. So at LAX, this service delivery chain, um, there's about 54,000 employees represented. And for LAWA, we only employ 3,000 of those folks. So it's difficult to get everyone in this chain to act as one airport experience instead of multiple service providers um, who are really not providing an identifiable airport experience at all. Uh, we know that if even one of these links is weak, weak and it breaks, um, it's a reflection not on just that one little link, but on the entire chain. So we know we're only as strong as our weakest link. So instead of these multicolored, distinct links, we're really trying to create something that's more like this, where it's just one feeling, one golden chain, um, regardless of who's actually responsible for providing that service. So instead of the nine separate terminals tied together by a traffic jam, we just want a, to create a feeling of one exceptional experience. The strategy, um, I think someone mentioned this earlier, is really the vision and the leadership from the top. Um, this is driven by our mayor, Eric Garcetti, who has a citywide vision to improve the level of service throughout the city. Um, it's being fulfilled by our CEO, Deborah Flint, who has been with us for about two years, and she's incredibly committed and passionate about improving the experience in big and bold ways. Um, adding to that strategy, we. We throw in a lot of heavy investment in our physical improvements um, almost everywhere. Uh, we have some 24 projects going on, and we're spending about $3 million a day. Um, and at the core of it is this project called the LAMP, or the Landside Access Modernization Program. Um, it's part of our $14 billion capital improvement program. We know that um, all of this money in the physical improvements in and of themselves does not assure that you're going to have an exceptional experience at the airport. So we have to go beyond the structures and the infrastructure and really invest in our people and our services. And that's really what our LA Exceptional Experience Initiative is all about. Um, it's our newest and transformative initiative that really outlines what it is that we want our guests to consistently feel on an ongoing basis. Um, this is our brand statement. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it says that at LAX, we strive to make our guest visits efficient, hospitable, and memorable by providing modern world-class facilities, services, and innovation that showcase the ambiance and excitement of LA and the lifestyle and warmth of sunny Southern California. It's all about an LA exceptional experience. And what's um, unique about this brand statement that was that it was created by a cross-section of our own employees. So we all know that this is what we're striving for every day. It's sort of our promise that we make for our um, guests. Um, one of the overarching philosophies of LA Exceptional Experience is that we have the shift um, to a hospitality mindset where our passengers are not just customers, but they're actually guests in our home who are valued and appreciated. Um, so we use the G word a lot. 
And the other word that we encourage people to use is the four letter F word, which you all know is feel. I don't know what you guys are thinking this four letter F word was. Um, so this is a huge mindset shift for us because in the past, uh, airport people would argue that we are not in the hospitality um, industry. We are in the transportation business. All we need to do is get people from A to B. Um, now the mindset shift is that um, the focus is on the guest and their experience on their A to B journey. Um, this is our strategic roadmap that really outlines where we're going with this strategy. Um, we talk about guest first, which is really the feedback mechanism. Happy guest is guest satisfaction and improving our rankings um, in the guest satisfaction world. Um, informed guest is about providing people with information before they get to the airport so they feel a little bit more in control of their journey. Um, engaged employees and partners is so important. Um, it requires a lot of collaboration. Ambiance and feeling is really about creating those uh, stress-free experiences. Um, guest delight is really about putting those little extras that help put the fun back into travel. And then policy in integration is really dull, but it's so important in making sure that the guest experience is just embedded into everything that we do. I won't go through each of these circles, but I wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, one is the guest first um, feedback circle. Um, for the first time, we're collecting that kind of data through the ASQ, or the Airport Service Quality Survey. Um, it benchmarks us against 300 other airports in the world. Um, it gives us really good data so we can see what people are saying, prioritize, and, and really look at our resources and, and time and really focus on what's important. Um, the collaboration with the engagement with our, our employees and uh, partners is so important. Recently, we uh, put together two guest experience councils. One is an internal one um, with key people from um, LAWA, and the other is an external group made up of our uh, key tenants. So it includes our airlines, concessionaires, um, TSAs at the table, as well as customs and border protection. Uh, we know that there's no one silver bullet to really improve the guest experience. Um, so we're taking a multi-pronged approach, looking at different programs and tools, um, priority projects which are identified by our ASQ scores. We're looking at technology and innovation, and then of course the people piece, which is so important. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of information with you about that. Um, we recently launched a holistic approach to employee and partner engagement. We've launched airport-wide training for all 54,000 badged employees. Um, this is supported by mystery shops so that we, we can find out if what's being um, learned in the classroom is being applied on the job. Um, we have a, those mystery shops are supported by coaching and consultations um, and a rewards and recognition program. And then underlying all of that is we have a communications piece. So we make sure that people um, it's not just a one and done thing, but it's, uh, it's uh, communicated on an ongoing basis. These are the um, behaviors that are the core of the training. And again, this is unique because it was created by our own employees, um, including our tenant partners. Um, so with all the crazy things happening in the news, um, it's really important now more than ever to show people that at LAX we do care. Um, we're also emphasizing that improving the guest experience is not just my job, but it's everybody's job at the airport, no matter who you work for or what you do. So we're asking people to think about these types of questions in their decision making. Things like, does your decision support the LAX brand statement? Um, how does your decision affect our guests? What will our guests see, hear, um, smell, taste, feel? Um, we're really trying to embed this into our culture. And all the while, while we're building this culture and building the facilities, we're having fun along the way. So we have a lot of um, fun things that we've been doing. And we also recently launched an entertainment program as well. So is this strategic roadmap getting us anywhere? Um, I'd have to say yes, in that um, every quarter, our ASQ scores have improved. So that's a good thing. Um, and then also earlier this year, we were named as one of Skytrack's top 10 most improved airports in the world. So it seems to be working, um, and we're really pleased with our progress. Um, I should also mention our concessions group was also recognized for some really outstanding work that they've been doing. And then lastly, um, staying focused on the guests really comes down to this one question, and that is, who do you work for? 
Uh, most people will say the name of their boss or their airline or their organization, but we have to remember that we really do work for the guests. Um, without them, we really um, wouldn't have a job or a purpose, and without our guests, we couldn't possibly fulfill our min mission at LAWA, which is to serve the world, connecting people, places, and cultures. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you so much for your time, and um, thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I know we've run a little bit long here, so maybe if there's questions for the panelists, maybe we can ask those uh, individually after the session's over. Uh, thanks again to San Luis Obispo County Airport uh, as one of our sponsors in JetBlue. We really appreciate that. And how about a big hand for all of our panelists here tonight? <laughs>